Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to our third and final session of today's NIAB Tree Fruit Day. This afternoon is very much um, a, a focus on tree fruit pests, and we've we've had a bit about diseases before lunch. We've got a lot to tell you about a lot of different projects that are going on on tree fruit pests, um, most notably some that are funded by British Apples and Pears. And it's fantastic that British Apples and Pears has got its uh, research program organized and up and running for the industry and we'd like to share some results with you from some of the work they've been funding this year. We're going to start off with um, Jude Benison in a minute, a moment from ADAS and then we have a series of other presentations that will take us through till about quarter past three. So to, to kick off then um, I'll invite Jude Benison to join us. Jude works for ADAS and um, she's going to tell us a little bit about a new problem, wood lice in apple orchards. So hopefully you're with us, Jude. We're just trying to connect to Jude at the moment. Can you hear us, Jude? Jude is frozen. Can you hear us? Got Jude here. So we've got you, but we're not able to present at the moment, are we? It won't allow us to share screen. Okay. Is it something to do with the screens? Um, Jude, we're getting a bit of feedback as well on the line. Can you can you just talk to me a minute? And we'll. Can yeah, you I'm sorry. Sorry, the computer seems to have frozen. <laughs> okay, this is the second time this has happened today. Um, Jude, perhaps I'll tell you what we can do if if, if we. have Possibly got Sarah. Sarah Arnold might be with us. Um, we can move on to the next talk and then come back to you, Jude, if that would help. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine, Scott. Okay. We 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 are we're also getting feedback on your line as well. So there's there's an issue with your sound. So perhaps if you want to come out and come back in, um, Sarah, I don't know whether you are um hopefully ready and available. Um, yeah. You're with us. Okay. So let's let's share let's uh, share screens with Sarah Arnold. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, British Apples and Pears are funding work on wood lice and apples. Well, they're also funding a project on woolly apple aphid uh, with us at NIAB at, uh, at East Malling. Um, I'm afraid to say that Michelle Fountain was supposed to be presenting today, and uh, we wish Michelle well. She has got a real, really bad problem with her back today, and uh, I think is barely able to get out of bed. So she has been following us and sending some messages in. Michelle, we hope you're... Uh, on the men soon, but Sarah is uh, stepping in. Sarah is one of Michelle's team. So Sarah, perhaps if you can um, unmute and uh, switch your camera on. Yep, um, um, see, we, my we camera are. is we've, on and I'm unmuted. So hopefully everyone can see me and hear me. We've got you. So perhaps you'll take us through the, the results of the work that uh, you, Michelle and others have been doing on Woolly Apple Aphid. Yep, absolutely. So as Scott's already said, this work was possible thanks to the generosity and support of British apples and pears, and the focus is on woolly apple aphids and alternative strategies for control. The background to this is that the chemistry available to growers is essentially getting less and less. Uh, so a lot of the products that growers have been working with and depending on over previous years are either getting withdrawn or the dosage or the spray, number of spray applications are getting reduced. So there's many fewer products available for the control of major apple orchard pests. Um, and one of those includes uh, spirotetramat based products, Batavia Movento, which are quite important in woolly apple aphid control. So we're interested in other strategies. Um, it's an important pest. It can cause things like tree stunting and poor growth and poor yield. Um, and one of the options that has perhaps been underexplored previously is earwigs as a biological control. These are really important generalist predators. Um, so they'll eat a whole variety of pests on the farm. Um, they used to be really frequent in apple orchards, but some recent data suggests that the numbers might be getting lower in, these days. And a technology that can help to improve this is the wig nest. This has been developed um, with Russell IPM and NIAB in a previous IUK project and now is commercially available. So over 2023, we were doing a field study looking at mass relocation of earwigs into orchards that had a woolly apple aphid problem supported by wig nest technology. So the wig nest is really quite straightforward. 
Um, it's available from AgriVista, so if you want to give it a go, you can buy it and try it. Um, it's basically a wooden sort of shelter trap and you can hang it in the tree. And the real advantage of this is that it brings the earwigs up into the canopy of the tree rather than having them crawling around on the floor. It's got food in it, so it's a food that's really attractive to earwigs. And so that means that these traps will hopefully be used more by earwigs than by anything else. Um, and you can help to encourage the earwigs to where they're needed. So perhaps deploy wig nests into areas that have woolly apple aphid particularly badly and so on. So the trial that we carried out in 2023 involved three orchards with a known problem. Um, and the diagram on the right hand side of this slide shows if each dot is a tree, the idea of um, having subplots of about nine trees each. And some of those sub subplots were treatment. So they had a wig nest and uh, earwig deployment and some of them were control. So no earwigs. And then the whole orchard just got the standard management uh, procedure for that orchard. So this meant that it was quite a robust study. It's quite highly replicated because there were quite a lot of these subplots in each of the orchards. And we put out the um, wig nests at the end of June, so all within a one week period across the three orchards. So the first job, of course, is to harvest hundreds of earwigs in order to load up the wig nests. Um, and we've got future ideas about how to make that more efficient. And then you put the wig nest into a lunchbox, essentially, with some earwigs and the earwigs crawl into the wig nest and take shelter and settle down there. And then as long as you're careful, you can deploy them onto trees. So you're preloading your orchard with, wig with earwigs and in wig nests, if you like. And then over the course of the season, we assessed the woolly apple aphid intensity on the bark and also on the, the young shoots and leaf nodes. And we also looked at the number of earwigs in the wig nests later on in the season to see, are the earwigs actually using the wig nests or do they happily migrate out of them and never visit them again once they're in the orchards. So the first thing that we can report on is the fact that overall there was a trend towards the plots that got the earwig treatment having smaller numbers of woolly apple aphid in the bark. Um, this wasn't quite significant but the trend is definitely positive and in the right direction. If we break this down between the three orchards it gets a bit more interesting. So the second orchard, site two, um, shows quite a big difference between the treated and the control at certain points in the year. So for that site, it did seem like the presence of the earwigs was helping to control the woolly apple aphid. And also the third site, the subplots that contained uh, that we were going to add the earwigs to started off with a higher level of woolly apple aphid in compared to the control plots. So, but then by the end of the season, both of the both the test and control plots had about the same number. So it does seem like there is something going on there um, and it would definitely be good to follow this up in future years because it seems like it certainly works on some sites perhaps and certainly doesn't do any damage to um, deploy extra earwigs into the farms. If we look at the woolly apple aphids on the shoots, so on the leaf nodes, again the difference between the plots with the wig nests and the plots without wasn't quite significant, but the same sort of trends and directions of the effects um, were showing the same sort of patterns. So again, it's, it's cautiously positive, but I don't want to say it's statistically robust yet. But there were quite low numbers of woolly apple aphids on some of these young shoots. So it's also working with quite low numbers. You can see the leaf node infestation rate was sitting at about two or 3%. Um, so perhaps, in a year with much higher leaf node infestation rates, you might see something different. So were the earwigs actually using the wig nests? The answer is yes. Not very much else was. So the graph in the top right hand corner, you can see lots of earwigs per wig nest and small numbers of spiders and ladybirds, but it was mostly the earwigs. Um, and it does seem like overall, the more earwigs you get in the wig nest, the smaller the number of total aphids. Um, and rather than overinterpreting this, it could be that it could be that the earwigs having them present at high numbers is helping to bring the aphid number down. But I don't want to conflate uh, correlation and causation here. So that's something that we'd need to dig into a little bit more. Um, so this fits into an overall landscape of work being done in this area that's starting to build up a picture about the value of aphids in orchards. Um, so for example, there's a study from Catalonia 
where they did releases of the earwigs into orchards every year over about a five-year period. And the first year, they didn't see much of an effect. But from the second year onwards, as those earwig populations started to build, they saw good woolly apple aphid control starting to happen. The other good thing is that the, um, the earwig control mechanism is completely compatible with Aphelinus marley, the um, major parasitoid of woolly apple aphids, so the two can be used together um, and won't have any negative impacts. Similarly, there's studies from the USA where they took earwigs from stone fruit orchards where they're less desirable and introduced them into apple and pear orchards. And they also, a bit like us, started to see a trend for lower pest density, but it wasn't a strong effect. Um, and also an interesting work from Bischoff where they actually bagged um, branches of trees and put woolly apple put um, earwigs in with the woolly apple aphids and here they found that the earwig control was better on less complex branches so shorter with fewer side shoots and things like this so there may be an interaction between things like the tree complexity and the pruning regimes and how effective earwig control is so I will conclude there because it's it's a fairly straightforward study and hopefully we'll be able to do more of this in future years and understand how this control builds and whether an initial introduction leads to a persistent positive impact of putting earwigs into orchards uh, and controlling woolly apple aphid in the future. So yeah the earwig refuges didn't have a significant impact this year but all the trends were in the right direction and showing positive things. Um, we did see a little bit of an impact on the um, difference between the treatment and non-treatment plots in terms of the woolly apple aphid colony size on the young shoots, the shoot leaf nodes in the middle of the season. Um, so that might be something to follow up. We're really interested in what this means longer term, whether re-inoculations would be needed. So do we have to keep adding more earwigs year after year? and how this interacts with the orchard complexity. So would it work the same way on three-year-old trees that were quite well pruned compared to much older trees? So I'll thank you all very much for listening um, and definitely acknowledge all of the team at NIAB who've made this possible and have worked quite hard on this project. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and thank you for stepping into Michelle's shoes at the, at the last minute. And we do hope that Michelle's uh, pain is easing a little bit. Um, one quick question I have is regarding the wig nests. Um, I think they come, is it Russell IPM that supply those or can you get them from a range of suppliers? Um, I think you can get them directly from Russell IPM, but I think you can also buy them from AgriVista. Oh, okay. Um, we we have lots of them scattered around our orchards at East Smalling and we have them in the Plum Demonstration Centre. And uh, yeah, it's always quite interesting when I'm walking through there, I often open one up and have a look inside and see all sorts in there. So, <laughs> um, yeah, um, I would definitely recommend that people try try them at least in small numbers, if if nothing else. Um, just checking that, uh, yeah, I, in fact, we've we, Michelle from her sick bed has just sent a message through saying that AgriVista uh, also supply them too. So that's uh, that's good. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Sarah. So we're going to move back and we hopefully, we think we've resolved the problem with Jude Benison. Uh, so Jude, if you're with us again, perhaps you could try sharing again for hopefully the second time. It appears to be working, but uh, we'll see. Do, do Roger's start video. Hello, Scott, can you hear yeah, me? We can hear you and the sound quality is better and we can now see your presentation. So if you want to hit the um, presentation mode. There we are. Um, we can see your um, next slide. I don't know if you're able to. Okay, so we're good um, to go then, yeah? There we are. That's fine. Yes. Okay, on. thanks. Thanks very much, Scott. And sorry yeah. for the hiccups earlier, no, everybody. No, no problem at all. Just to reintroduce you. So Jude is Jude and our colleague Rory have been doing work on wood lice in apple orchards, which seems to be a new problem. And Jude and Rory have been investigating. So Jude, what have you found out? OK, thanks very much, Scott. OK, so I'm giving this presentation on behalf of my colleague Rory, who's away on his skiing holiday at the moment. Um, but I have been involved in the project as well. Um, it's a one year project funded by British Apples and Pears. And um, it's about wood lice, uh, which over the last couple of years have become a new problem in apple orchards. 
So the project objectives um, are to confirm grower problems with wood lice and infect investigate factors affecting incidents, identify the species, confirm they can actually do damage to fruit. And we've done a literature review to try and find out what's known about wood lice biology, damage to various crops, any potential IPM strategies and any promising lines for future research. So wood lice are generally viewed as beneficials. Um, they break down organic matter in the soil and they usually feed on decaying plant material, but sometimes they can feed on living plants. And in recent years, as I say, um, some growers, um, particularly in Kent, have seen large numbers of wood lice in apple orchards and damage to fruit. Uh, but we, we know very little about their potential as emerging pests of apple. So a bit about their biology and behaviour. Wood lice are not insects, they are isopods. Um, they are terrestrial, they can live for up to five years. They're very um, susceptible to desiccation and to get round this, they are nocturnal, so they're only really active at night and they aggregate during the day in um, hidden away places and refuges on the ground. And um, there's about 37 species of wood lice in the UK, five of which are common. And there's another 10 species that just breed in glass houses. Um, a bit about the life cycle. Um, there are males and females. The females do lay eggs. They have these brood pouches of eggs. Um, and when the eggs hatch into the young wood lice, they molt several times into bigger young ones and they reach sexual maturity after about a year. Sorry about that. Um, so as I say they aggregate to form dense clusters um, to get over their desiccation problems. Um, and this aggregation behaviour is very fast, uh, but the behaviour varies both between species and also within species. Um, wood lice have been shown to be attracted to their own faeces. Um, it has been suggested there might be an aggregation pheromone in the faeces. Um, another worker has suggested cuticular pheromones might be important in aggregation. Uh, we know they are attracted to their own species and those of other species and they can be attracted or repelled by certain chemicals and I would like to thank David Hall at the University of Greenwich NRI for his contribution to the literature review on the attractants and the repellents. So wood lice can um, occur as pests. Uh, for example, in glass houses, they've been recorded as a pest on organic tomato crops that are grown in the soil rather than in, in soil free media like most of them are grown conventionally. Also, they've been uh, recorded as damaging aubergine and cucumbers. And I, re I remember when cucumbers used to be grown on straw bales in the old days, uh, we used to see wood louse damage to cucumber fruit. And in Tunisia, they've been recorded as a pest of melon. As far as control measures go, uh, Rob Jacobson and Phil Morley did some work in some AHDB funded research about 15 years ago um, and showed that in, in um, an organic tomato crop, ferric phosphate slug pellets sprinkled on the growing media um, gave some control. And some work in Germany showed that Entomopathogenic nematodes formulated together with a bait could be effective against wood lice. Nematodes applied as a drench, as they are normally for soil dwelling pests, didn't seem to be effective, but this bait formulation seemed to show more promise. Neither of those methods, the slug pellets or the nematodes, have been uh, tested yet in an orchard situation. So factors affecting incidents, well, as part of the um, review, Rory visited quite a few orchards in Kent um, and spoke to a lot of growers and fruit agronomists. And um, 
everybody had their own theory, really, what was causing wood lice to suddenly become a problem over the last few years. Um, climatic conditions are thought to be um, influential. For example, wood lice are more active after rainfall, maybe after dry conditions. During dry conditions, maybe wood lice climb trees to seek moisture. Um, someone had a theory that after a long dry spell, when you get rain, that can cause the apples to swell and the skin to split, allowing wood lice access to open up the damage a bit more. Uh, temperature could be um, a factor. And soil type, um, Rory visited this, these two adjacent orchards here, and this orchard um, had more wood lice and more damage than this one. And this one had much sandier soil, uh, which probably more free draining. Certainly we saw a lot more damage to apples that were in clusters rather than single apples. And I know some growers did tell us that they had changed their thinning practices over recent years. That could well be a factor. And then some people thought loss of actives could be contributing, for example, can no longer use something like chlorpyrifos. Maybe when that was applied for control of other pests, it might have given incidental control of wood lice. And in Italy, um, there has been a report that in conventionally managed orchards, there's less isopods than in organic orchards. So incidents both within the same orchard and between orchards can be very variable. Uh, for example, in this one, uh, there were significantly more wood lice in this bottom blue corner than in the top red corner. And the grower said that there was much damper conditions down in this corner. And one grower thought that he saw more wood lice adjacent to woodland, um, but there weren't any more wood lice when Rory assessed them up here than in, in the other end of the orchard, well, um, well away from the woodland. So it's very difficult to come to any firm conclusions really on the um, environmental factors affecting incidents. When we look at the damage they cause, as I say, we often found large numbers of wood lice and damage in apple clusters. The damage was often around the top of the apple. You can see all the wood lice frass here, the droppings. That's probably some of the worst damage we saw. Um, sometimes we saw damage in other parts of the apple on the side of the fruit. Occasionally, Rory thought they were secondary to other physical damage to the skin. Um, the damage was seen at harvest and occasionally we, we, we did see wood lice present and there was no or, or very little damage. So Rory did a couple of lab tests. The first one was with Gala, which is one of the um, varieties that growers um, reported seeing wood lice damage on. It is one of the later picked varieties and that seems to be um, where growers are seeing more wood lice and damage. Um, in this experiment, Rory damaged some of the apples with a, a scalpel to make a fine slit in the skin to see if that and then he introduced wood lice in plastic sandwich boxes. And he, he found that there was wood lice damage with or without the scalpel slit. But he did say that near, all the apples had some degree of russeting around the stalk and that sort of roughened the skin a little bit and might have allowed wood lice to sort of take advantage of that and start to cause the damage. And the second experiment was with Braeburn, which is another late picked variety that growers have seen wood lice damage on. Uh, Rory didn't do any of the scalpel slitting in this experiment. Um, he had apples that were had slight russeting around the stalk, like this one, or without. And he found that after one week, um, only the russeted fruit was damaged. And after two weeks, you can see more extensive damage there. The, the fruit that didn't have any russeting was not damaged. So that does seem to be a contributing factor. Um, when we looked at the species present, Rory collected them from 10 orchards. Um, he's currently identified them all as the common rough woodlouse, Porcelio scaber, which is a, a common species in the UK. Um, he's still got a few more 
um, samples to identify. And the species do vary in their tolerance of desiccation and therefore their aggregation behaviour. As well as on the fruit, um, other places we found them on in this particular orchard, they were inside hollow canes. When, when they were tapped, all the wood lice came flooding out the bottom. And often we found them in rough areas on the bark, such as cankered areas like this. So the preliminary conclusions are wood lice are damaging fruit that would otherwise be marketable. Uh, clusters of fruit seem to be important, um, giving the wood lice a sheltered, humid environment maybe. Russeting seems to allow damage from what we can see in the experiments we did. Damage is report reported to be worse later in the season on late pit varieties such as Gala and Braeburn. Uh, it's very difficult to interpret the factors affecting distribution and so far we've only really monitored orchards in Kent in one year where one species was mainly causing the damage. So looking to the future, well at the moment there's no current control methods recommended for wood lice control in apple. Uh, one grower actually sprayed his entire orchard with delta methrin because his damage was so bad so that's obviously not something that is compatible with IPM. Um, I think we need to know more about the biology and behavior of wood lice in orchards, uh, potential IPM strategies, well maybe if we gave them refuges um, on the ground maybe that would stop them shinning up trees and damaging apples. Uh, maybe we could look at um, using attractants and repellents in combination with refuges. And as I say, nematodes and ferric phosphate slug pellets, both of which would be compatible with IPM. They, they haven't really been tested in, a, in an orchard situation, so that might be something um, that could be worth looking at. Um, Rory has just given you a QR code here and, and asked if anybody would be willing to um, look at that and contribute to a short survey, which should only take five minutes, because he, he's interested to know how widespread wood lice are on apple throughout the country, because uh, so far we've on, only really mon monitored them in Kent. So if you do get a chance to um, do that survey, even if you don't have wood lice damage, I'd still be interested to hear from you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jude, and thank you for taking on a presentation from somebody else's work as well. It's never an easy thing to do, so we're grateful to you for that. Um, we have some questions. Um, first one, um, which may be a bit unfair since you, you went in charge of the work, but do you know the species of nematode that was effective? Wondering if the same uh, species is effective on codling moth and apple sawfly. Yeah, I mean, the... the, the... The species um, that was tested in Germany that was found to be affected was Sinonema carpocapsi. Okay. So that's that's useful. Thank you. And then another question was when you looked for lice, uh, wood lice in other locations, were there significantly more in the canes compared with the support post cracks? Um, I'm not sure that Rory actually compared numbers in that situation. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. Um, well, that that's concludes the questions, I think, but uh, thank you for presenting again. Uh, and I think just to make the point that um, British Apples and Pears are now, um, some of these projects that they've been funding are now delivering results and we're very grateful to them for spending their money on these projects. And hopefully in time, these will start to deliver better results and useful results that can be used by the industry. Jude, thanks for your time. Um, we will move on. And um, Jude did make mention earlier of the loss of broad spectrum insecticides like chlorpyrifos uh, and the increase in a number of different pests as a result of that. Um, perhaps apple softlight is one of those. This is a piece of work that's been done at NIAB and Francesca Elliott is going to talk to us about what she's been doing and colleagues have been doing to develop new techniques to control apple softly. So Francesca, if you can share with us now your presentation, hopefully, and switch your camera on. There we are, we can see you. Hi, Scott. We can hear you as well, that's good news. So if you share your presentation with us. 
That's good. It's working. That's right. That's Lovely. Good. And if you hit the presentation mode, oh. we'll be up and running. Perfect. I should just say Francesca is another of the entomology team working with Michelle at NIAB. So, Francesca, tell us what you've been finding. Hi there. Um, so, yes, I'm a research technician on the entomology team at East Malling here. And today I'm going to take you through several projects we've been working on to develop new techniques to control apple store fly. And these projects have been led by Drs. Michelle Fountain, Francis Wilmonje and Sarah Arnold. So a little bit of background, um, Hoplocampa testudinia, um, the apple sore fly, um, is a re-emerging pest in the UK. Um, similar to Jude, it's because um, insecticides have been withdrawn and there's currently no conventional insecticides license to treat apple sore fly in the UK or Europe. Um, we have reported crop losses of up to 80% in the UK as a result. Um, apple store fly um, give us a very limited window for control because they spend 11 months of the year underground as part of their life cycle um, and there's only one generation a year to target. The control methods, especially in organic orchards, are very labour intensive and it relies on um, fruit thinning and picking out um, affected apples such as those shown on the left hand side in order to remove the larvae from the life cycle. We therefore require effective management tools compatible with IPM and organic production. Okay, so in 2023, um, we had three projects. These were funded by the Worshipful Company of Fruiterers, UKRI, and British Apples and Pears. The overall objectives of these projects were to optimise PP collection method so that we could look at the adult apple store fly in the lab, and to rear on these larvae to adulthood at NIAB, to detect any pheromone components released by the apple store fly, to record adult numbers and measure fruit damage in orchards, to deploy and test the large scale integrated management system, and con to conduct a lab pilot trial of nematodes. Uh, so, collection and rearing. Um, there is um, a method developed in the Netherlands um, for collecting the cocoons from soil. Um, we optimise this method um, for using clay um, because um, it's not possible to sieve clay as you would, um, for example, with a sandy soil. Um, we needed to um, soak the clay and soften it. And then um, we just found the cocoons would float to the surface, uh, as you can see in the right hand photo at the top there. We then collected any of these cocoons and checked them to see whether they were viable, making sure that there were no um, parasitoid entry holes in them. They were then reared in incubators in the laboratory at NIAB. Um, we collected 80 viable pupae, and to get that number, we had manually processed over 500 trays of soil. Um, and we collected them on site here at East Morling and at a couple of orchards um, across the country. We found that we've got low emergence levels from the cocoons in the laboratory. Uh, this could be a consequence of natural mortality, um, of parasitism. Uh, we did actually have some adult parasitoids emerge from the cocoons. Um, but also, um, apple saw fly may go into prolonged diapause, which can last two to three years. And um, so possibly uh, these cocoons are still viable, they just haven't emerged yet. Additionally, we tried some adult emergence traps in the orchard. Um, however, we didn't catch, capture any apple store fly using this method. Um, with the um, adults that we reared in the lab, we kept them virgin, so they were reared individually, so they didn't have the opportunity to mate. We then entrained them using the equipment shown in the top left-hand photo. And this enabled us to collect volatiles that may be released by the apple store fly. Uh, we then sent the samples to David Hall's group at the Natural Resources Institute, who analysed the samples. Uh, and they've, uh, they've previously done this for two related apple store fly species and have been able to detect pheromones. Um, but unfortunately, in this case, they weren't able to detect pheromone. They did detect cuticular hydrocarbons, so they used these to produce a possible lure. And then we tested this lure against uh, the pheromones for the other storefly species 
and against the control in the orchard. However, we found there was no significant difference between treatments. Um, we deployed rebel trapped um, at East Morning and growers deployed them for us in their orchard where they uh, knew they had apple saw fly. Um, they recorded the numbers weekly and then reported this back to us and this enabled Francis to produce heat maps of the apple saw fly numbers by date. And you can see an example of this on the bottom left hand side. So the highest number of apple saw fly are in the darkest blue. We found that um, across all the sites we monitored, uh, there was a peak in adults in early May, and then a uniform uh, decline in numbers across all of the sites by late May to June. So this seems to indicate that there's a universal uh, environmental influence, such as temperature or the um, development stage of the apple trees that's having an impact. We also conducted damage assessments. So the growers let us know when they first uh, detected signs of damage to the recruitlet. Uh, this could be primary damage, such as ribbon scarring, or the secondary damage where the larvae had entered the fruit. And then we went out to the um, orchards to carry out assessments. To do this, we counted the total number of fruit on a representative number of trees. We then assessed the number of fruit damaged by apple saw fly on 20 trees in this area. And by looking at those numbers, we were able to calculate the percentage of fruit that had been damaged by apple saw fly. There you can see a graph on the left of the sites where we carried this out. Uh, one site was untreated, the other four sites were organic. Um, overall, we had low levels of damage. Uh, we didn't reach 5% of damage, um, but the untreated site is higher than the organic. We also try apple saw fly mass trapping, um, so sticky traps are used for monitoring. Um, there's a theory that um, white traps could be more effective than blue, and this was tested in France, I believe, um, and blue was found to be um, more effective. We deployed 50% uh, blue traps and 50% white traps uh, at a density of 100 per hectare in the orchard um, in April, and then we monitored the numbers on those. Um, we found that in the UK, white was more effective. However, it's not a significant difference. Um, it could be because the pest pressure on this occasion was quite low. We also looked at nematode control by carrying out um, an assessment in the lab. To do this, we collected over a thousand affected apple fruitlets and waited for the larvae to exit the fruit. We then collected them and put them in spots of compost where they were treated with either exhibit line SF, exhibit line HB, Nemesis L, or were left untreated as a control. After 14 days, we retrieved the larvae and dissected them to see if there were any nematodes. Um, we found in the experiment overall, there was very high mortality, um, including in the control. But where we did um, locate the larvae after the 14 days and dissect them, um, it was found that exhibit line SF and Nemesis L had both infected several larvae and emerged in large numbers on the left, you can see in photos. Um, so this proves that it is possible for the nematodes um, to infect the larvae. Uh, in conclusion, um, apple saw fly pupae can be collected from orchard stores using flotation. Um, however, it is very high manual input. Um, to get relatively low numbers. Apple store fly PUP can be read in the laboratory, but again, the emergence levels are low. So the more cocoons you can collect, the better. On this occasion, we found no apple store fly sex pheromone. Um, so there's a potential that um, apple store fly are using other cues um, to, for males and females to meet. Um, and a project investigating this would be really interesting. We found that there was a peak in adult apple saw fly activity in the first half of May. So our recommendations for that would be to deploy traps early in the spring before emergence, to use orchard specific monitoring strategies to optimise trap placement and density, and to remove those traps following petal fall to avoid catching beneficial insects.
uh, we discovered that the numbers of apple sawfly adults are not homogenous across the site. So you should target your traps to the hotspot areas. We found that white traps were uh, more attractive than blue, but further trials of apple sawfly mass trapping with a focus on white traps would be beneficial. And we discovered that nematodes can in fact infect apple sawfly, but more work would be required to optimise the method. For example, retesting using topsoil rather than compost uh, to keep the larvae in. Uh, I'd like to say a very big thank you to the growers who really helped us out with this project and to our industry partners. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Francesca. Um, that's very helpful. Um, we have made a little bit of progress. I know you sounded a little bit negative towards the end, but uh, <laughs> Michelle's been really struggling, grappling with this for quite some time, hasn't she? Trying to rear um, adults from um, pupae. And so, I, you know, we have made some progress. Um, we have quite, quite a bit of chat coming in and some questions for you. Uh, one comment, it would be worth looking at Steiner Nirmar Carpocapsae nematodes on apple sawfly in addition to the species tested. Um, question here for Francesca, do and bare herbicide strips make it, uh, apple sawfly any worse, do we know? Oh, I'm not sure. That wasn't within the scope of this study. Okay. Uh, I'm well, not sure if there's any others. If Michelle's uh, back is not killing her too much and she's able to respond to that, she might be able to put something in the chat. She might have some thoughts on that. Another question about what height above the ground um, were the trick sticky traps placed for mass trapping? You... So around a, a metre oh. high. Um, I believe the rebel traps were placed at head height, human head height. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Francesca. Really appreciate you uh, providing that update. And um, we shall move on um, to Francis, Francis Womonji. So Francis has been doing some work on brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, we have talked about brown marmorated stink bug in this forum and this event before. And uh, Francis has been uh, funded by DEFRA to continue monitoring brown marmorated stink bug just to see um, how much it's been spreading in the UK and to learn a little bit more about its movements and uh, what we might do about it should it become a major problem in the UK. Uh, good afternoon, Francis. If you, uh, yeah, we can see you. Um, good afternoon, Scott. Um, we can hear you. Um, just before you start, I can just say that uh, yeah, Michelle and others have uh, responded in the chat to some of those questions. So please check the chat. Uh, you'll see the, the responses to those questions on Apple Softline. So Francis, tell us a little bit about what you've been uh, doing on brown marmorated stink bug in the last year. Uh, thank you very uh, much, Scott, and I'm very happy to present this work. I'm going to present uh, work which is funded by DEFRA, uh, but also some slides towards the end uh, for work on a review that was funded by British Apples and Pears, and we are really grateful for their support on this. So just a bit of a background on brown marmorated stink bug. It's a pentatomic bug. It's native to Asia, but has since spread quite significantly across the globe, and it's now very well established in the Americas and on the continent of Europe. Uh, the first European presence was recorded in 2004 in Liechtenstein and Switzerland, and there's been a subsequent uh, spread. Now, for the UK, there have been interceptions at UK ports since 2010, and NAB has been tracking uh, this particular insect since 2018 in collaboration with partners. Uh, notably, in 2021, uh, for the first time, both male and female brown motor stink bug were detected uh, in the UK, which then raises the possibility and the prospect of there being breeding pairs. Um, of brown water stink bug, but we've not been able to detect any uh, younger life forms, uh, which would be really the smoking gun that this is happening. And later on, I'll share with you the 2023 results. Uh, but just to get back to the insect itself, uh, in case you see one of these, please take a picture uh, and send it to us. Uh, these are the key features. Uh, the head is almost rectangular. And then there's this pale uh, row of dots uh, across uh, the body, which is really the distinguishing feature. And there are very many native species which look like well, stink bugs, so please don't kill those. 
uh, just take a photo and send if you're in doubt. Uh, these are some of the helpful keys which you may be able to use to check the insect that you've uh, taken a photo of. Uh, this is a picture of damage caused by brown water stink bug on pears and apples. You can see the deformity of the fruit. It would be, of course, unmarketable. But when you slice it open, then you find that there are these uh, you know, damage within the flesh of the fruit as well. So this is a recap. For those people who attended last year, you may have seen this slide. Uh, but this is work which has gone on collaboratively between NIAB, the RHS, and the Natural History Museum in terms of setting up crops. And as I mentioned, you can see we began in 2018. And by the time we're getting to 2022, you can see we are really beginning to detect uh, both males and females uh, from pheromone traps. And so in uh, last year, we continued this work. This is a map showing the places where we set up these traps. A key difference uh, with this uh, last year's approach was we were proactive. Whenever somebody sent us a photo of brown winter stink bug, uh, and it was a confirmed finding, we then sent traps in that area so that in case there were others within the locality, they would get trapped. And hence, we were able to increase our trap coverage to up to 35 traps from the previous year's 30. Uh, we also have a dedicated email, uh, which we monitor regularly. And we also check uh, for groups within Facebook that post these insects on top of looking at iNaturalist and other platforms for postings. We've been particularly keen uh, to partner with owners of camper van sites in Kent and Bristol, because one of the things which we uh, did suspect and were vindicated this year was that the incursions would likely come in through camper vans returning back from holiday makers on the continent. And this led to the first finding, I'll show you the next slide, uh, or the report of vomit stink Stinkbug from a camper van returning. We had a lot of very large uh, finding in Yorkshire, which was reported to us. But in addition to that, uh, for example, the one from Scotland uh, was linked to visitors coming to stay at an Airbnb in Scotland. So there are very many ways in which Bomite stink bug can come into the country and we have to remain vigilant. So this is the data for 2023. So as I mentioned, uh, pretty early, we began getting reports uh, from Camper Van owners reported. So was reported to Max Buckley at Natural History Museum. Uh, the owner of this camper van is based in Northern Ireland, uh, but they were returning back from France. Um, and then, uh, of course, later on in the year, in October, we had uh, another camper van returning back via Dover. And the owners were very vigilant and they intercepted uh, these bugs. They, they killed uh, very many of those. We did send our traps there, uh, but they also sent us some live insects, which we then uh, reared to see whether they would produce viable eggs. That did not happen. Uh, we think it's because probably by the time we were getting them in the season, it coincided with the time when bombarded sink bug goes into diapos. But in addition to that, we still got reports from uh, more northerly areas like uh, Porton and Fifth Scotland uh, from people coming to visit. And these are just some of those uh, pictures of uh, the reports that uh, uh, we got of Bombard stink bug in the previous year. So we are looking uh, to continue with this surveillance, we've uh, applied to DEFRA for continuation funding. Uh, the feedback is looking positive. We, of course, have to wait for a go uh, from them, and then we can continue with this work, which is very helpful. But in addition to that, uh, we did get support from industry and specifically from British apples and pears. And this was to do an in depth review of control and monitoring strategies that are used in other parts of the world so that the industry could remain well informed and abreast of the current control measures that are being used. And I'm just going to summarize a few of those. Uh, there were quite a number of papers looking at enhanced trap attraction, uh, such as using bimodal traps, using LED lights combined with the pheromones to significantly increase GMSB capture. Uh, there's also groups that are looking at new trap designs. Uh, for example, the Nazgul trap, uh, which is in the picture in the center. And this is a combination of a pheromone and an insecticide treated uh, in your net. Uh, but on the right, that's what I'm going to tell uh, all my small nieces happens. Then 
uh, there are researchers also looking at aligning the trapping with the phenology of brown marmoted stink bugs so as to maximize the effectiveness of, of the traps. There is a lot of work which has gone into looking at biocontrol strategies for brown marmoted stink bug. And this featured prominently uh, in uh, the European Conference on Entomology, which I attended last year. And very many researchers are looking at ways of exploiting parasitoids and specifically egg parasitoids. Now, the samurai wasp, Chrysocas japonicus, uh, has proven to be a very effective parasitoid against Vermonte stinkbug. It's not native uh, to the UK or to Europe. However, recent reports uh, you know, tell us that it's been approved for use in uh, Switzerland. So if at some point uh, then that Bromite Stinkbug became established uh, within the UK, this may be an avenue that may be worth uh, exploring. Of course, a lot of research needs to go into looking at climate compatibility. There is work on the content that's been done on that and the potential of non-target uh, species being uh, parasitized by the parasitoids. But the main focus is also on integrating parasitoid use into mainstream uh, IPM uh, frameworks. Pheromone traps remain the first line of defense. Uh, these are two pictures uh, from uh, our, our partners. And the one on the right is a picture sent to us by uh, Dr. Glenn Powell uh, at the time when he was at RHS of, this was a female bromoated stink bug which was trapped in the pheromone traps. So both males and females do get attracted to this trap, suggesting that they do seek each other out in nature. And in this particular trap, both males and females, uh, you know, uh, were captured. Eggs were laid, but they were not, uh, you know, viable. So, hence our insistence to try and keep the surveillance based on these pheromone traps going. In addition to that, uh, new and innovative methods are coming to the fore. Uh, some of them involve the use of drones and UV light. So the idea here is to have uh, places where you can deploy fluorescent powder. And as the insects crawl in areas which are heavily infested, there's Italy, at night if you fly a drone with UV light, you can be able to get a measure of the uh, population dynamics of bomber testing bug. There are also studies looking at terrain and canopy analysis, uh, particularly those which uh, seem to correlate increased moisture and uh, a denser terrain with increased presence of bromate stink bug. But further to that, there are molecular tools, eDNA being, of course, one of those features the lead, uh, but also uh, studies looking at genetic diversity and genetic sequencing. And the whole idea about this is to know where are the incursions coming from. If you get hold, for example, of a bromate stink bug uh, in the UK, you really want to know whether its genetics are closer to what's on the continent or closer to what is in the US, then from there you can be able to tell where these incursions really you know, coming from through the genetic analysis. Um, and of course, forensic identification uh, using rapid DNA uh, based methods is also ongoing. Uh, there is some work uh, that is uh, being done by different groups on modeling, uh, trying to understand what would be the impact of changing climate on brown matter stink bug. And really the take home from this slide, uh, if you look at B, what it simply says is that if the UK does warm up, then there is the possibility of there being more than one generation of brown and stick back in the UK. Right, thank you. And I'll now take your questions. Thank you so much, Fran Francis. Um... Yeah, just, just to make a point about brown marmorated to stink bug, um, it's obviously very different from spotted wing drosophila, another invasive species, because it uh, appeared in the UK in 2012 and it very much took off. Um, we've been finding brown marmorated to stink bug for, for some years here, but it's not obviously spread rapidly like spotted wing drosophila. But interestingly, I'm the secretariat of the Spotted Winged Drosophila Working Group, and that has sort of evolved and morphed into a new group called the Spotted Winged Drosophila and Invasive Pests and Disease Working Group. And we, funnily enough, had a meeting earlier this week, which Francis and I attended of that group. And uh, at that, we discussed brown marmorated stink bug as a potential pest, and we heard a very useful presentation from a lady called Sarah Hyatt from SASA in Scotland, 
who was uh, who had done some she and her colleagues had done some modeling work that had been funded by Scotland's Plant Health Centre. And I think, Francis, I'm writing if I interpreted her message correctly, the modeling showed that if global warming and climate change continues, um, then brown marmorated stink bug could start to be a, a bigger problem in southeast and eastern England by 2030. But yes. it wasn't likely to become a big problem for Scotland until 2080. Is, yes. is, was, is, is, have I interpreted that correctly? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so uh, I think the point is we've got a little bit more time to play with this one than we did with spotted wing drosophila. Uh, and hopefully you, you can continue your good work over the over the coming well months and years uh, so that we are perhaps slightly better prepared for it if, if and when it does become a bigger problem. I'm just having a look at in the chat um, comment, a helpful comment from An Jonathan Blackman saying that Ander Matt have a product which they are keen to try here, and he's given us a useful link there. Um, you will also see in the chat facility that Michelle Fountain has responded to a number of the questions, um, and uh, you'll find some good answers there from Michelle. Just also, I, just going back a little bit in time to the Apple Softfly, um, sorry, big pun to the. Um, the, the discussions we had about wig nests and refuges. Uh, Andrew Russell from Russell IPM just did confirm in the chat there that uh, they are manufactured by Russell IPM but sold by AgroVista. Um, Francis, we've got another question that's just come in. Are we taking learning for any of the hazelnut work on brown marmorated stink bug that was done in the USA? Somebody called Nick Willman is doing some very useful work in relation to that industry. I don't know if you're aware of that, are you? I'll have to check it up, but that's a really nice uh, pointer to work, which I'd like to have a look at. Yeah, okay. Well, so the Andermatt, uh, just to mention, they also stock the similar kind of pheromone traps that we do have that we use in our surveillance. So in addition to what has been posted there. Right, okay. Um, my final comment on this would perhaps be, perhaps we have a new pest of the tree fruit industry and it's called camper vans. Um, but, uh, any camper van enthusiasts, please take that uh, as, as as a friendly remark and not as an antagonistic one. So maybe Scott, I can take advantage and just say that uh, if we do get the funding uh, from DEFRA to continue, we will be reaching out to uh, camper van clubs uh, yeah. to help with the public health, uh, public uh, uh, engagement uh, on Bromeda stink bug. So yep, yep, that's that's absolutely right. I've had discussions with that Francis about that, and we've already started thinking about how we might uh, keep the camper van and caravan clubs um notified and informed about this. But uh, so I think we'll be hearing more from you about this, um, Francis. We'll also be hearing more from you shortly because you're yes. going to come back and tell us a little bit about forest bug. But before we do that, we're going to give you a rest. Um, we're going to move on to codling moth. Um, now, Charles Whitfield, our, another colleague of ours at NIAB in Michelle Fountain's team, um, has been doing a, some more work for British Apples and Pears that they funded doing a review of codling moth. And um, a huge amount of work has been done on codling moth over, over the years, including monitoring using um, the, the RIM Procidia model and so on. And um, NIAB has done quite a lot of work on this. Um, but Charles sadly is not here to present today. Uh, he's uh, he's been otherwise detained, uh, engaged in another activity. So Charles has kindly recorded a presentation for us. So he is going to present, but in recorded form. So I'm going to ask my colleague Phoebe if she will um, share Charles's presentation. So we'll just do the technical bit here. Here we go. So. If you want to hit the start button, Phoebe, and we can sit back and enjoy this presentation. Sorry, Scott. Say, but if anyone has any questions or comments, please contact either myself. Show by phone or email. So, my name is Charles Rickfield, and I'm going to talk today about some work that Michelle and I have been working on. She's part of a project led by Michelle on integrated pest management of tree fruit, funded by British Apples and Pears. So many thanks to them for their support and input in completing this work. Um, this part of the project that I'm going to talk about today focuses on the control of coddling. The work for this project started last year when Michelle organised a meeting with the great and the good in the top fruit sector to discuss the current status, issues and any possible ideas for controlling coddling in the UK and abroad. 
It was an informative meeting covering a wide range of topics, including insect phenology, integrated pest management strategies, predictive modeling, and availability of approved insecticides. So we also have a follow-up meeting later in March this year, where we may discuss some of the findings from this report. The aim of this work is to identify any important new developments in control of codling moth that are applicable to the UK and crucially can target all life stages. So we did this by conducting an extensive literature review, mostly from the past 10 years, but it also included some of the older research. And I think in total, we've collectively reviewed around 350 papers from around the world. Um, the output from this will be detailed in a report covering a range of topics on problem of and its control. Uh, the report will include conclusions and suggestions for any future work, specifically in the UK. Unfortunately, there isn't time today, today to go into lots of detail on all the topics we've covered. But I'll give an overview of the topics, some of our findings, and the direction of control that we think we should be going in. So the report covers recent reviews, probably month, focusing on biology and its management and control across various geographic locations from 2011 to 2023. There's a large section on integrated pest management and the area wide management which includes the uh, five-year Codling Moth Area-Wide Management Program that was done in the USA. Um, includes the 20-year program, uh, the Oxia uh, program in Canada, which was about sterile insect release. And a program in Uruguay that covers around 3,500 hectares and includes 85% of the country production and 360 growers. Uh, we also go into detail on sterile insect technique, which, as far as I know, has never really been trialled in the UK for codling moth. So the SIT programmes are no small undertaking and requires collaboration between growers, agronomy providers and other businesses and organisations and potentially local government. However, if successfully implemented, it can dramatically reduce the need for other control measures. We review a wide range of topics that come under the heading of semiochemicals. And as many of you know, semiochemicals are the communication uh, via chemicals, which are often volatile or aromatic compounds. This includes pheromones, which are used in mating disruption. Mating disruption is not currently uh, commonly used in the UK for various reasons. But new knowledge and combining it with other strategies, such as female attractants or sterile insect technique offers the potential for mating disruption to be far more effective than previously. So a semiochemical approach to controlling moth pests can increase prevalence of non-target species, improving natural pest suppression and also waste decomposition within the orchard. So it has lots of knock-on benefits. Over the past 20 years, there has been quite a lot of research directed towards the identification and testing of volatile compounds and odour blends that are attractive to female and male cuddling moth. And in the last few years, two new female attractive blends have been commercialised in the USA. And these have been extensively field tested in America and other parts of the world and can be used as part of monitoring programmes or combined with other control strategies. Female caramone attractants offer several advantages over male-only pheromone attractants, including better knowledge of female flight and mated status. And monitoring traps baited with these female attractants can be used within mating disruption areas as they are not competing with the wide area pheromone dispensers. Um, and also, because every female moth that is removed from the orchard directly reduces the number of eggs being laid. So there's another form of semiochemical uh, control, which is repellent compounds. And there hasn't been so much research on repellents for cuddling moth, but there are a handful of compounds that have been identified that could be effective in orchards if formulated into, in a suitable way. 
on their own, they are unlikely to offer sufficient control, but when used in conjunction with other products, they could be very effective. Yeah. So, for example, they could form part of the push-pull program. Mating disruption is an interesting area. I thought it was worth spending a little bit more time on it today. Um, as many of us know, it can certainly go wrong. Uh, particularly when orchard areas are adjacent to neighbouring farms that are not using native disruption, or next to residential areas with lots of fruit trees. It is extremely difficult to stop gravid females entering the crop area in those scenarios. So these issues can be overcome by area-wide deployment of native disruption over several years. And the graph on the left here shows an area-wide mating disruption program running in Washington State, USA. And after a couple of years, the percentage of fruit damage due to codling moth was greatly reduced. And the number of insecticidal sprays that were, that were required reduced from three to one. More recently, field trials have been conducted to combine mating disruption, which was not area-wide, with female attractants in traps, at a rate of 60 traps per hectare, so very high. However, the combination of mating disruption plus female removal by the uh, female attracting traps significantly reduced the percentage of fruit damage compared to mating disruption alone. And interestingly, more than 60% of the females captured in those traps were mated, confirming that mating disruption by itself was not enough to stop the moths mating and other positive means of the crop. Some of the other topics that are included in this report include trapping. The biggest development over the past decade in trapping codling moth and other insects is the use of automated traps and artificial intelligence. There are many automated trapping systems available that can be used for codling moth. There are some examples shown on the right of this slide. However, the costs of buying and maintaining these can be off-putting. And some research suggests that the that the detection systems in certain trap models are not as accurate as human scouts can be. Uh, and also that the traps may not be as attractive as standard delta traps. <laughs> However, the systems are improving all the time and automated monitoring offers some major advantages compared to manual scouting, which includes reducing the labor and time taken to check traps. It allows instant alerts and supports faster decision making. And potentially also the sharing of data across wide areas, across farms, to improve the knowledge of the wider cuddling moth populations. The report also covers research on prediction models and thresholds. Many in the UK are already using the RIMPRO models, but there are quite a few other prediction models out there. And the accuracy of these models could be improved with the inclusion of a female flight biofix date, which could be done by using female attractants in monitoring traps. Another crucial area of research is the impact of climate change. And there is already evidence that in certain geographic locations, the number of codling moth generations per season has already increased over the past 20 years. It may be due to the warming climate, but there's probably some other factors play as well. Um, in fact, researchers in Switzerland used future climate models to predict that the local coddling moth populations would have a second, to maybe even a third generation per season, and also a much larger starting population at the start of the year due to increased numbers of overwintering larvae. The report covers new understanding and trials measuring the effectiveness of biological control. There are many options for biological control agents, including augmenting biological control species. But getting beneficial insects into large orchard areas can be a time consuming and costly business. Trials have been done to investigate the effectiveness of using drones to deploy beneficial insects, such as ladybirds and lacewings, into orchards. And these can be very useful in reducing codling moth and other pests. There are also sections on the use of nematodes and vertebrate predators, and of course, granular virus. 
Some of the other work presented here today by my colleagues show the benefit that wildflowers planted in alleyways can have on supporting beneficial predatory insects and then subsequently reducing the codling moth populations. There's also netting, which although expensive, has many advantages when it comes to protecting crops from biotic and abiotic stresses. The report also goes into different cultivars and post-harvest strategies to reduce codling moth. So in conclusion, codling moth will become an increasingly difficult pest to control and it may be exacerbated by the loss of approval in the future, certain insecticides, and perhaps also an extension to the moth's period of activity throughout the season due to climate change and other factors affecting the moth's phenology. Control is most effective when applied on an area-wide basis over a number of seasons, which brings the wider population down to manageable levels. And there have been many new developments in control strategies which can form part of an effective IPM program. There are options for targeting each life stage. And in our opinion, the UK tree fruit industry should coordinate and develop a long term sustainable approach, including the control of other tree fruit pests. So I'll just finish showing two more slides. So Michelle has created this summary of control strategies that are available currently and can be used over a season to push codling moth populations into a downward trajectory. She's also created this diagram that shows the potential future options for controlling codling moth. And some of these are already available and others could be available soon. Crucially, all the life stages of the codling moth can be targeted now, we're not suggesting that all these need to be applied every season. Work is needed to identify which are the most effective and cost effective in UK orchards. But the good news is that there are lots of options coming through to help control this increasingly difficult pest. Thank you all for listening. And as I said, if you've got any questions, please get in contact with Michelle or myself. Well, thank you to Charles for recording that uh, for us. Um, I think there's a recurring theme with all of this, uh, a lot of this pest that we've been hearing about today, and that is that uh, we continue to lose more conventional crop protection products or plant protection products. And we're continually having to look for more strategic and coordinated area-wide approaches uh, and long-term sustainable approaches. And um, that continues to give us additional work at NIAB and uh, Michelle and her team continue to um, in, embrace all of this and continue to work. And of course, we can never deliver things quickly enough. That's the biggest frustration for us. But I think uh, the work that we're doing and we continue to do at NIAB at East Malling is sort of embracing all of uh, these novel approaches and area-wide approaches. So watch this space. Uh, we'll see how things develop. Um, this also brings me gives me a good opportunity to raise the issue of the Apple Best Practice Guide. Some of you will remember that the Apple Best Practice Guide was produced or was commissioned and, and funded by DEFRA back in the late 1990s and a series of experts from ADAS, FAST and uh, East Malling um, put together the, the, the whole or compiled the whole set of guidelines. Um, it was in paper format. The AHDB developed it into an electronic format and NIAB has now transferred that. We've agreed with the AHDB that we can um, host that um, electronic version of the best practice guide on our website and it is now available to view. I do try and update it and as uh, new research results become available like the ones we've been hearing about today, I will continue to update it. Um, if you go on the NIAB website and look under the membership tab and then the NIAB fruit page, you will find the Apple Best Practice Guide. And uh, please do use it. Please do look at it. Um, as I said earlier, it's a, it's a working work in progress, but I have updated it relatively recently. There is more updating still to be done. Um, what we'll probably do is advertise through the, the uh, trade press and through other channels and through our NIAB registration fruit list um, contact details, um, update everybody where it's available and how to find it. But uh, if you have time, please do have a look at that. So um, that takes us on to our next topic. And I'm going to invite Francis Momonji to come back again. Francis, we've heard about already on brown marmorated stink bug. 
And uh, Francis has uh, also been doing some work on forest bug control. And uh, Francis, before we get into forest bug, I just wondered, I wanted to take you back to the chat forum because we have we did get another question following on from your talk about brown mammary to stink bug, or it was a comment, somebody stating that uh, presumably any vehicle could constitute a mode of transmission of brown mammary to stink bug. You might have some thoughts on that. Um, why are, are they more attracted to white camper vans than any other vehicle? So as I mentioned this, uh, they could come in through any vehicle, but uh, what normally happens is that people will go on holiday and they'll spend quite a bit of time. And if it's at that time of the season when the adults are looking for places to begin to overwinter, then they will hide within uh, camper vans. And so camper vans then tend to be a very uh, you know, popular mode for them to, to come in, so it seems. But any vehicle could be could be vulnerable. Good. Okay, thank you for that clarification. We will move on to your next topic, which is forest bug. And I think yeah, this is another example of a pest which has increased in um in in population and incidence, probably as a result of a reduced use of broad spectrum control products. So Francis, tell us a little bit about who's funding you and what you've been doing. Indeed. Thank you, Scott, once again. So uh, this uh, project is handed through the FIP uh, via IUK, and the partners in this project uh, were both academic and, and, and industry. So our partners were AgroVista and Avalon, who are the main agro, who are the agronomy partners, but we also had Russell, who make uh, this pheromone traps and uh, they were critical you know, to our thinking. Uh, but we also collaborated with um, the University of Greenwich uh, because we've got a very strong chemical ecology component over there. And our goal, of course, was to identify the pheromone um, or forest bug. And what we really wanted to get was identify the pheromone because that hasn't been done and then create species specific traps which then could be used to monitor a forest bug. Uh, if it was successful, then it could be advanced for uh, additional work downstream. Uh, but before we get into it, I'd just like to point out the damage uh, you know, caused by forest bug on apples and pears. And uh, for those who have seen my other slides on bermuded stink bug, you can tell the difference. So there's this very deep pitting uh, on the surface of the, uh, of the fruit, which is different from what we saw with bermuded stink bug. Uh, but there's still a lot of damage uh, you know, within uh, the flesh. And uh, of course, you know that there would be no way you're going to sell this fruit in the market. So huge losses uh, can occur uh, caused by a uh, forest bug. This is the life cycle of forest bug. Uh, the key thing here really is that it overwinters from October to April as a second Easter Eve. So as soon as the weather begins to warm up, then it's already upon you and uh, in the orchard. And so the damage then becomes very, very pronounced because it will get to maturity and go through all these life uh, you know, stages uh, within the orchard. So we were very keen then uh, to rear this uh, forest bug so that we could use them in experiments and specifically to try and detect the pheromone. And this hadn't been done before. And this slide just shows our transition from trying a very complicated uh, diet uh, devised by Michelle and Celine, uh, and how it remarkably became simplified when we had uh, a forest bug working group put together by Michelle. And we had this uh, very nice meeting with partners uh, from, from Europe. And Dr. Tim Hay said, look, it's possible to feed the forest bug on slices of apple. And as long as you change those every day or two, uh, they're pretty much uh, uh, going to, to keep growing. And this greatly enhanced our ability to experiment with forest bug. So that was cracked remarkably easy after a year. Uh, we're also very keen to understand the phenology of forest bug within the fields in the UK, because this data did not exist before. And through the collaboration of our agronomy partners, AgroVista and Avalon, um, and our team at NAB, we went out in the field very many times and collected uh, 
uh, forest bug and recorded uh, the life stage at which they were. These are the same forest bug which we then reared uh, within uh, the, the lab for additional work to be done. So this is very good diet. And uh, Alex Radu and his team at AgroVista have since taken these forward and they are now beginning to develop a working model uh, to try and forecast the development of forest bug based on the uh, growing degree days and the temperature. And as we continue to get more data on this, then this should be enriched so that the phonology data is put into a more constructive uh, model. So this is really thanks to uh, Rad Wendy's team. Back at NIAB, uh, our task uh, was initially to uh, be able to sex the forest bug so that we could entrain volatiles or pheromones from volatile organic compounds, possibly containing uh, you know, sex pheromones from uh, males and females separately. Because it was there were photos which we had seen of forest bug aggregating, and we did not know whether uh, the pheromone involved was from the male or the female. So Celine Silva is the one, uh, and, and Michelle, who uh, really did most of this work, identifying how we could uh, sex this. And the initial entrainment, uh, which is the collection of the volatile compound by using flowing air, and then it gets into uh, this porapak filter, which has got a matrix which traps uh, the compounds, was with adults. So we began uh, initially with uh, uh, younger adults, but then we figured out less at the mature a bit. So we moved to 14 day old uh, entrainments. And for the first year, we did that. Uh, but from the results then that we got, uh, we then uh, decided to entrain even the juvenile stages. So all the way from L3 through to L5, uh, we did uh, collect uh, in volatiles. However, uh, despite the efforts at NRI and the team there, uh, we're not able to identify any pheromone compounds. And this trace uh, on the right hand uh, just shows that between the males and females, they are got similar compounds. Uh, some of them are fairly familiar, but uh, unfortunately, we could not detect any uh, pheromones. However, as I mentioned, we also did entrainment of the younger uh, you know, nymphs. And from there, uh, the team at NRI detected some known alarm compounds, tridecane, uh, E4-oxohexanol, and 2 tecanol And then uh, we then thought that there could be the chance maybe to pivot because Respective of what happens, forest bug remains a problem. And, and we thought maybe we can try and see whether we can develop repellents uh, from this. And we then began to devise experiments to exploit that. Uh, the compound, the repellent compound, was um, synthesized uh, by the team at NRI. And then we began uh, to do our experiments. However, the choice test initially uh, that we did on just blue roll and having a leaf and then the repellent on one side and uh, the control the side and the insect uh, in the middle did not show any differences. We didn't give up. We moved uh, the experiments into uh, a different arena uh, where we could control the airflow, uh, so the tunnels. Uh, and in both experiments, which we did on petri dishes to see how quickly they left uh, arenas, which either had got uh, this tube impregnated with uh, the repellent or without, uh, we could not really find any significant differences. Uh, we then tried to create a more natural environment by using twigs and having the repellent and then trying to uh, measure, and then we measure the time when it, it would take to move away from the repellent. But as you can see in the bottom graph, uh, that there was no difference. Uh, those are not the only set of experiments that we did. We also did experiments uh, in the field. Uh, one of those was to then try and use adult forest bug to see whether there could be an attractant that they do release uh, while in the field. And we tried two different formats for this. The first one was to use a rescue uh, sting trap with an adult uh, forest bug uh, as an attractant. Uh, but these efforts, again, did not uh, yield any success in as far as finding whether there was attraction going on. Uh, we then 
Uh, also tested out infield repellents initially with black sticky traps with no success. Uh, but then we thought we can do something more. We can have a long-term experiment and deploy repellents which have got a higher dosage and then check this spring. So this will be going on next week and the week after to see whether in the areas where we deployed this uh, higher dosage uh, repellents have got a lower infestation of forest bugs. So we get to know whether uh, that does offer uh, some relief. But that wasn't the only way in which we had to pivot uh, in this project. So in collaboration with also IPM, we then began to explore the possibility of using light of different spectra to see whether this uh, you know, could uh, be effective in the monitoring of brown, of, uh, sorry, of forest bug. Uh, and the team at Riso IPM, Russell, uh, that is Rehem and her team, then uh, made these traps uh, with different uh, LEDs. So looking at using green light and uh, blue light and, uh, and white light. And we then deployed this out in the field and you can see in the first picture, this is a green light and at the bottom we've got a bug dome. In the bug dome, we've got this um, uh, egg trace in there, which then would provide a habitat for the insects as they flew in. And then we leave this running for a couple of nights, check them every morning to see um, you know, what's in there. So we did catch a lot of moths, which was the downside, but we did also catch uh, some forest bug using this uh, technique. And uh, to summarize, what we really saw uh, providing us some hope was uh, the blue light traps. At this point, I must mention that this data is not really replicated, uh, but it was for us to get some preliminary data on whether we could advance this idea uh, further. And the answer is yes, we do intend to advance it further uh, if we've got uh, the funding to do so. So in conclusion concerning this work, uh, in which we've had to innovate and pivot a lot, uh, is that we can say that pheromones are unlikely to be involved in forest bug aggregation. Uh, there are pieces of literature that we've had a look at, which seem to suggest that probably there could be the involvement of acoustic signals. Uh, we did have a very curious recording, indeed, of that vibrating. Um, Long-term repellents are being tested, and it will be collected uh, in the coming weeks. Hopefully, I can pre uh, present a bit more of this uh, next year if we do get uh, a chance to do so again. Uh, but importantly, we do find that light traps may have value in monitoring, and definitely this does need more experimentation, and we are hoping to be able to advance this in the short term. Thank you, and I'll take your questions. Thank you again, Francis. Uh, an ongoing piece of work here, which uh, isn't reaping instant rewards, but uh, we are making progress with. I'm just checking the chat facility. I don't think we have anything through for you so far, but uh, do stay with us. And if there are any um, questions submitted to you, then you're able to, 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 to respond to them in the chat facility. Um, what I think I'll just finish off by saying on this, uh, we've heard today a lot about various funded projects, particularly Growing Kent Medway, uh, AHDB, BBSRC, Innovate UK, um, and British Apples and Pears Limited. Now, one thing I wanted to say was that uh, with a lot of the projects from Innovate UK, for instance, Innovate UK do not pay um, us the full cost of the project work that we do. And we are incredibly indebted and grateful to the East Malling Trust, um, who not only host the work that uh, NIAB do at East Malling, but they help to support us with such projects which don't pay full economic cost. And uh, if it wasn't for the East Malling Trust, uh, we wouldn't necessarily be able to do all these projects. So we are very grateful to them for uh, the help and support that they give us each year. So thank you to the, the East Malling Trust. And um, thank you to you, Francis. Um, please do check the chat facility, but we will move on to Spotted Wing Drosophila. So we have two further talks for this afternoon to, to see through to the end of today's session. And um, both on Spotted Wing Drosophila, um, the first from Adam Walker uh, on bait sprays. And uh, we've talked a lot about the use of bait sprays in recent years, whereby um, a bait spray can be used to attract the insect, in this case, Spotted Wing Drosophila, in to, to feed on a, a control product. And um, there's been a lot of discussion about this. We've had some success with it in recent years. 
But the question in, indeed that was regularly being posed on this forum in previous years was how, how much impact does the bait spray and the combination of the bait spray with the um, control product have on non-target and beneficial insects? And we've uh, done work that's been funded by AHDB and Worshipful Company of Fruiters. And Adam is going to reveal what we have been finding. Um, Adam Walker, I should say, is another entomologist that works in Michelle's team. We've had just about everybody from Michelle's team talking this afternoon. And Adam is probably the last piece of the jigsaw. So, Adam, tell us a little bit more about what you've been finding. Thanks, Scott. Can you hear me OK? We can. We can see your presentation perfectly, too. Great. OK, yes. So um, previously, NIAB and Microbiotech have done plenty of work testing bait sprays and the effectiveness at controlling spotted wing drosophila. We've run semi-field trials in strawberry, raspberry and cherry. And what these trials have found is that bait sprays are as effective at standard full foliar applications of the same insecticides at controlling spotted wing drosophila. Now, I'm not going to present data on that today, but that information can be found in the AHDB report. But as you said, one of the key questions that we often get asked in these presentations is do bait sprays impact non-target species that are found in the crop? Things like beneficials, like pollinators and natural enemies. So over the last few years, we've been done, doing experiments to investigate this, and that's what I'm going to present on today. But before I start, I'm going to give a quick recap on what bait sprays are. So what they involve is mixing a feeding attractant in with the spray, which attracts the target pest to feed on the spray. And when they do so, they also ingest the plant protection product, which in the case of our experiments is an insecticide directed at SWD. They can be applied um, in a band, so in a more targeted manner, rather than the standard full foliar application of traditional sprays, which relies on a fine mist covering all of the foliage and um, the pest makes contact with their spray by landing on the foliage um, rather than being attracted to it as in the bait spray. And in doing so, they often require less water to apply them. And in the case of our experiments, they're quicker to apply. So the experiments that I'm going to be talking about today, investigating if there's an impact on non-target species, is a field trial in commercial raspberry, and then a laboratory trial in experimental arenas, which are effectively jars and boxes. So first of all, the field trial in commercial raspberry. So the crop was uh, polytunnel grown raspberry. And what we did is divide the tunnels into sections and we designated a different treatment to each section in a random order. And this was replicated to prevent bias. This table shows the list of treatments. Now, before I talk about the key features of the table, um, something that's important to mention is the products and the rates in this table were agreed for the experiment. Um, and therefore, if you're planning to use baits with sprays for controlling specific pests in specific crops, please consult a basis qualified expert before you do. Now, as you can see from the table, we had six different treatments. Um, we alternated two different insecticides, Tracer and XRL, weekly. And for treatments one to three, um, we these were insecticides without the bait. These were applied at water volumes of 500 litres per hectare as a full foliar spray of fine mist. Treatments four to six were applied with the adjuvant baits. These were applied at a rate of 40 litres per hectare as one metre bands on one side of the crop foliage. Now you notice that there's no untreated control here. This is because we are working in a commercial raspberry crop and we didn't want to encourage a build up of SWD. Um, that could otherwise affect the rest of the crop. And the adjuvants that we used as baits were CombiProtect and ProBands. So now I'm going to talk about the results, starting with pollinator surveys. So we ran pollinator surveys in the different crops receiving the different treatments, and we counted the number of visits from different pollinators. And the main ones were bumblebees and honeybees. Talking about bumblebees first, so what we found overall is no significant difference 
I mean, numbers of bumblebee visits between the different treatments shown by the different color bars on the right hand side. For honeybees, it was the same story, no significant difference in numbers between the different treatments. We also made observations on where the pollinators were landing on the crop. They were mostly seen landing on the flowers and fruits. We also observed them landing on the foliage, but we didn't see them feeding on the bait spray droplets. So for this experiment, um, we also had, um, we also did tap samples for other non-targets, including natural enemies. Of these, we found no significant differences between the different treatments and their numbers. Uh, these included aureus, parasoids, and predatory spiders. Now, as well as looking at the um, non-targets, we also got data on SWD control during this experiment, and this information can be found in the AHDB report. Now, moving on to the laboratory study. So we tested um, different non-target insects enclosed in experimental boxes with the treatments for a robust test. And this table shows the list of the six different treatments that we tested. We tested an insecticide on its own, which was Tracer in this experiment. Then we tested uh, two different adjuvants on their own to make sure that they're not toxic to the non-targets. These are Combi Protect and Probands. We tested Combi Protect um, bait with Tracer and Probands with Tracer. And we had a water control as well in this experiment. And these are the different non-target insects that we tested those treatments on. These are insects that are commonly found in the crops that we've been looking at. And we offered them sugar water, all of them sugar water, and in some cases, an, another food source, like alternative food source where suitable. And we tested the mortality at different um, lengths of time, depending on the life expectancy of the insect in question. So you can see on the right hand side of this table. So these pictures show examples of the um, experiment set up in these boxes. The treatments were applied as boxes, to the, uh, sorry, the treatments were applied as droplets applied to the leaves, as you can see in this picture. And on the right hand side, you can see a sugar feeder with a yellow wick and an alternative food source in the Petri dish with it. And the insects were introduced into these. So the insects that we tested, they could be categorized into three main groups. Group one, which I'll talk about now, included adult hoverflies, aureus and earwigs. And in this group, um, the insecticide with and without bait was significantly more toxic than the other treatments, that's water and the two different adjuvants on their own. But there was no difference in toxicity between spinosad with and without the, with and without the bait. The second group includes Drosophila melanogaster. Again, the insecticide with and without the bait was significantly more toxic compared to water and the adjuvant baits on their own. But in this case, when the bait was added to the insecticide, it was significantly more toxic than the insecticide on its own. And this is presumably because Drosophila melanogaster being closely related to SWD shows a similar response. It's feeding on the droplets and it's ingesting the insecticide so it's dying more quickly. And then the final group includes lacewing and ladybird larvae. And in this group, the insecticide, whether with or without bait, um, was no more toxic than the water and the adjuvant baits on their own. And this is possibly because they're either not making contact with the droplets or the level of insecticide in the droplets is not high enough to affect them. So that was the end of the results section. Moving on to the conclusions. So what our experiments have found is that baits in, applied indirectly as large droplets are no more toxic to beneficial insects than standard full foliar applications of the same insecticides without baits. So in principle, um, exposure to the insecticides is reduced with a bait spray because you're using less product and it's being applied away from the flowers and fruits. So it's reducing down the residues in fresh produce. 
And these results are not just promising for SWD control, but also control of other pests in other crops. So thanks very much for listening. I'd like to thank the growers for all their support and also the AHDB and Worshipful Company of Free Trees. Any questions? Thank you, Adam. Um, there don't appear to be any at this stage, um, but all I would say is that uh, you've answered a lot of questions there um, in that, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've demonstrated that the, um, the use of bait sprays is no more harmful than using the, the traditional crop protection product on its own. So I, I'm very grateful to you for, um, well, we're grateful to this, the, the funders, um, HDB and Worshipful Company of Fruiters, uh, and to you and your colleagues for doing this work. Um, there will be a chance still to pose any further questions to Adam, if anybody wants to, over the next few minutes. He's still, I think you're staying with us, Adam, so you can yeah. respond. So just keep an eye out on the, on the chat. Um, but I think we'll move straight on into the final talk on spotted wing Drosophila. Uh, something completely different from Glenn Slade at Big Sis. And Glenn has been developing the use of sterile insect technique for controlling spotted wing Drosophila for several years. And you've heard from him at several of these events in recent times. Um, one of the biggest challenges for Glenn really over the last sort of 18 months, 24 months perhaps, is uh, having shown how effective sterile insect technique is. Um, he needs to find ways of um, rearing mass numbers of these uh, insects so that uh, it can become a commercial reality. And I'm glad to say Glenn is with us today and he's going to tell us what progress he's made over the last year or so. So Glenn, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Scott. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to present today. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Glenn Slade, founder and CEO at Bixis. Uh, we do biological insect control uh, that is intended to replace chemical insecticides. Our platform is based on the sterile insect technique and our first solution targets the spotted wing Drosophila. Now, I know a lot of you have heard my presentations before, but for any newcomers, a quick primer on the sterile insect technique. Uh, what that's about is producing sterile males of the pest insect, uh, which we then release regularly into the target area, such as a fruit crop, uh, where they can mate with wild females, um, and they then have no offspring. Um, I call it axiomatic efficacy because it's a solution that just works in any setting. It doesn't matter about the soil, the climate, the crop. Um, you know, sterile male plus female equals zero. Um, and the other thing that's really good about this technique is that it's very safe. And there's a 70 year track record with sterile insect technique. Um, it's species specific, of course, and it's non-toxic. Um, we don't kill anything in the field um, and it can't establish because it's sterile. And in the case of Big Sis, uh, we're making a point of using native strains. So in other words, we use an SWD colony that we captured in England to be released here. Um, and our solution is non-GMO. So that means we're already approved for sale without a permit in England um, and other jurisdictions as well. Um, as I mentioned, our first solution targets spotted wing Drosophila. And, and as people on the call will be well aware, um, this is a big unmet need of uh, growers of these fresh fruit, high value crops um, and the additional measures that have been brought in over the past 10 years or so to try and control just this one pest can run to thousands of pounds per hectare on top of the risk of having produce rejected. Um, and we've been working in conjunction with NIAB and Berry Gardens since 2019, 2020. Um, and you know, in 2021, we worked jointly on a project, uh, which was the first time in the world that uh, anyone had used SIT to control SWD in open field conditions. Um, and as you can see from the chart there, um, we managed to achieve season long control. So the bottom line is the number of wild female SWD per trap in the area that we were treating with uh, sterile males. The top line is a typical, was a comparable control. This was a strawberry crop. Um, and we achieved up to 91% uh, suppression of the adult females. So very pleased with that result. Um, and last year, um, sponsored by a global berry brand, we did another uh, trial, this time on raspberries. 
And what you can see on the left um, is that our 11 hectare plot was sort of in three blocks uh, that were harvested early, middle and late. Um, and that spanned from early July through to early September. Um, and those plots received sterile male SWD, but no chemical insecticide. On the right, you can see the maps of the uh, comparator control sites. Um, the early and late were close together. The, the mid harvest block was a bit further away. Um, again, the sponsor selected those to be very carefully aligned for variety and plant date. And the, the these, these were commercial crops, so therefore the grower decided uh, what to do. And, and it turned out that on each of those, one spray of spinosad uh, was applied during the harvest period. So this was um, SIT versus one spray of spinosad, spinosad as it turned out. Uh, we used two metrics, uh, two main metrics for this uh, trial. The first one was our usual red sticky trap with dry lure, which was the, the metric we had used in our 2021 trial. On top of that, the sponsor contracted NIAB to do flotation tests to measure larvae per fruit during harvest uh, in those different blocks. Um, and so basically I've got three sets of results uh, from this trial. Uh, the first one is measuring adult SWD based on those red sticky traps. Um, because these raspberries were basically harvested over a five week period, what these uh, columns and, and all the charts I'll show represent um, is data based on five a five week period as opposed to a moving average or anything like that. So during that period, the average adult female per trap, if we look at the blue columns, which are the untreated or well chemical treated site, um, you can see the sort of typical exponential growth as we go from early season to late season because the SWD population is building up. Um, and you can see that uh, the SIT treated blocks achieved up to 88% uh, suppression compared to control. Um, so comparable to the uh, 2021 study. So very pleased with that. Um, and a little detail you might notice on the early block, um, we actually had more than twice as many adult females in that early period. Now, this is because we did start releases a bit later than we wanted to this season, but obviously we were able to catch up and get ahead as we went through the season. And, you know, at least as importantly, if we go on to look at the number of larvae per fruit um, <clears throat> in these blocks, you can see that even in that early period, we achieved a 62% better i.e. lower count of larvae per fruit than the sprayed control. And what the reason for that is, of course, because although there were more adult females in that block, many of them were being mated with sterile males. The sterile eggs laid in the fruit did not hatch to become larvae to be detected in flotation tests. So obviously even better would be to have fewer, fewer females as well. Um, but it shows just how much of an impact sterile insects can have on fruit quality. And in the two later periods of the season, we had up to 80% fewer larvae per fruit, which obviously reduces the risk of rejection uh, substantially, as well as, of course, happy customers. Um, the third piece of data we got from this trial related to fruit waste at the time of picking. Um, you'll all be well aware that when pickers are picking raspberries, those that don't go in the punnet, either because they're mouldy or misformed or soggy or whatever, um, go into a waste bin. Those were measured in aggregate uh, for those five weeks. And what we can see is that in each uh, block, um, the SIT treated uh, raspberries lost less uh, of the yield to fruit waste. Now, of course, that is not specific to SWD, so it could be there are other reasons behind that, but obviously there's a pretty uh, consistent correlation with the uh, reduction in SWD numbers, um, and that's potentially a very valuable win for the grower. Um, so more good results, pleased to say, and to recap that the way Bixis 
offers this solution is as a service for season long control. So we're not just producing the sterile male SWD in our micro production units. We also take them to the field, do the releases, do the trapping. Um, and we use that to guide where we release the sterile males. And you can see a what we call a heat map at the bottom right of the, the slide. Um, and basically the, the warmer those colors, that means the more wild SWD have been detected. And so our releases would be biased to those areas, although we would release everywhere. And we can also release on the border, of course, because we're not a toxic spray. Um, and we offer this as a service for two reasons. You know, primarily to make sure there's zero hassle for the grower. They don't have to worry about getting the extra labor or, or a learning curve. But it also makes sure, particularly in these early years, we can um, make sure these are released in the right rate in the right location and we can continue to learn about how we deliver this and we may be flexible going forward as to other parties releasing these flies. Um, so being available in the market uh, for a, a regulatory light solution has been very good for our demand um, as, as well as our global berry leader wanting to get us deployed internationally, which we're very keen to work with them to do. Um, We've been recognized by Bloomberg UK as a startup to watch um, and a bit before that by Tesco's as a runner up in their startup competition. Um, and, and you know, at least as importantly, we've built, built some very strong partnerships with Berry Garden Growers and I have, for which I'm very grateful um, for the many years of support now. Um, and that is also matched by strong interest by other distributors and potential partners who can help us get this solution to market as we scale up. And as many of you will know um, that this year, as in previous years, our sales have been constrained by limited supply. Um, so what we've got available for 2024 is already fully committed. Um, but I'm very keen to be able to tell you uh, about the progress we're making with scaling up our production. Um, and I want to show you a short video about that. So basically the technology behind BigSys really centers around um, automating the production of sterile male SWD. And we do that by rearing insects one at a time. Um, and uh, well, I'll let the video uh, talk for itself, but the aim is to then be able to scale this up by replicating. Because if we can crack the process to rear a, you know, one insect or a thousand insects, then we can do it for a million insects or a billion insects. So I'll just play this video, hopefully. Where's it gone? So there we go. That's all there is to it. And uh, it's been quite a journey. Um, Bixis is over six years old now. And, uh, you know, off to the left of this chart has been a lot of plans and prototypes. Um, a couple of years ago, we were at the stage of putting together a simple pilot line that proved we could do that um, end to end. Um, about a year ago, we were had a system that in principle could do the high throughput we wanted. Um, but we we stumbled a bit because we didn't have the reliability and the uptime of that system. And now the V3 system, um, which is, as we speak, coming together and within hopefully in two weeks time, we'll be signing off this uh, system, um, is significant. And um, it's a bit subtle on this chart. You see it goes V1, V2, V3, but then the other yellow ar arrows are all V3. And that's because our V3 system, which is now um, got the right throughput and is very reliable, is something that we can now 
just replicate. So we will be filling our existing building with this production system um, and be able to supply up to 200 hectares for 2024. And our plan is for 2025 to fill a much bigger building, which we call a full-size microproduction unit MPU, um, and then be able to treat up to a thousand hectares. And then that microproduction unit in turn is something that we can replicate both in the UK and internationally to continue to grow our ability to deliver to growers. So very much looking forward to that uh, expansion going forwards. Thanks to everybody for their support to date. I'll leave it there for any questions. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, very enlightening and uh, excellent news again. You always bring... I, I, there, there is a reason for me keeping you to last because I want to finish on a positive and you always do that for us. So thank you so much indeed. Um, yeah, there are a couple of questions, uh, one of which Michelle, I think, has dealt with in the chat uh, facility. Uh, but another question was, what number of sterile meals are released uh, in the trials that you've been doing? Sure. So in the 2021 trial, um, we were releasing between four and 8,000 sterile males per hectare. Um, and in the 2023 work across the 11 hectares, the release rate was roughly 8,000 per hectare. It did go up and down a bit. Um, but again, we would have been you know, adapting that to the uh, presence of wild females so in the early days we'd have put more on the early block and just a, a maintenance level on the later blocks what we've found you know not just in that trial but many other areas um, is the challenge is always late season because the early blocks have finished harvesting but of course there are residual fruit and whatever you do to try and desiccate or knock down uh, residual flies they are a big uh, infestation source but we managed to keep that under control as the the mid and late blocks came on board. But basically, that release rate is something we you know continue to refine, and we adapt dynamically, both week by week and within the field. Good, uh, thank you, Glenn. Uh, there was another comment that's come in saying that the the video, although very good, was a little bit quick to absorb. So I, I I can answer that to one to some extent by saying, as I mentioned at the start of today, uh, all the presentations are going to be uploaded on the NIAB website, and we will alert you to when they're available. Um, Glenn, I don't know if you have that video on a website at all, do you? If anybody wants to watch it back, we do, Scott. So www.bigsys.tech. Um, and on the home page, if you scroll down a bit, you'll see uh, the video and it run, that, that particular clip runs from about one minute through to two minutes of a five minute video. Perfect. Good. Well, Glenn, thank you for giving up your time today to come and uh, give us an update. And um, we wish you success because I think this uh, is certainly going to help the, the industry. I, I have just one final question. We, we, um, we've we talked a bit about strawberries and raspberries today. We're in a tree fruit um, event. Uh, what, what's the, the next step for cherry growers? Because obviously they'll be taking an active interest in all of this. Absolutely. Yes, I was trying. I, I meant to slip in a reference to cherries. I, I've That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we've um, been treating cherries um, over the past years as well. Very pleased to say we've achieved uh, great control. What we've been doing uh, in 2023, and we'll be starting again in a couple of weeks' time, is releasing for cherry crops starting earlier in the year, so starting in March, because I've had my theory, which we so far has borne out, but we'll continue to collect data, that it's quite important to be in the field with our sterile males by the time the cherries are blossoming, because as um, people will know, Cherries is a crop where SWD tend to be present year round um, and you get the first peak of the population very often at that cherry blossom uh, period. What we don't want is that uh, population to be building up ahead of the fruiting season. So by keeping, you know, SIT works preventatively. So by making sure they don't get that opportunity to build up during flowering, we can keep that population low. But if you watch the video that's on the website, that's actually in a raspberry field, but it's next to a cherry field that we also treated at the same time. Good. Thank you. That's very helpful. Glenn, thank you once again. Um, so yeah. that concludes our tree fruit day. I'm just going to uh, share my slides for one final time, if I can. Uh, just bear with me.
Okay, so I um, just wanted to wrap up uh, this this afternoon. Um, first of all, by um, thanking all our presenters um, today. Um, hopefully you found the presentations to be useful, enlightening and clear. Um, but I'm very grateful to them all for taking the time to put uh, the work together for us. If you haven't yet done so, this is another chance to submit your basis and there are also points details um, in the chat box. I know a lot of you have been doing that throughout the course of today. Um, I did give you a QR code to use earlier today. You can use that as well. But if you haven't yet done so and you want us to add you to our list, please do that in the chat box now. Um, if you do have any other questions that you feel haven't been adequately answered today in our presentations or following our presentations, you can contact me on that email address, scott.raffle.niab.com. Uh, and I will um, pass them on to all our presenters uh, or our, our relevant presenters for each question. So uh, don't uh, feel shy in coming forward if you've got further questions. And just as I mentioned earlier, uh, the recording will be available uh, on the NIAB website and we will let people know um, when, uh, when, when they are there. It usually takes us a week or two to get them all loaded up. It does take, it's quite a time consuming process, but uh, we will alert you when that's done. Um, just to remind you that you can have further interaction with us. Um, if you want us to continue to communicate with you, uh, uh, alerting you to various other events, um, publications, and anything else we do, you can keep in touch with me again, scott.raffle at niab.com. And uh, we have a lot of information on our NIAB Fruit website, including, as I mentioned earlier, the Apple Best Practice Guide recordings of events like this um, and other useful information. So uh, please do let me know if you've got any other inquiries uh, regarding that. We hope you've enjoyed today and uh, thank you for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Do remind your colleagues or anybody, um, your customers that have not joined us today that they will be able to watch the recorded presentations at a later date and we hope they will all find that useful. In the meantime, thanks very much for joining us and we wish you a successful season ahead. Thank you.